I guess I can just jump in and start to tell you about what's an inverse problem. So, which will be the general setting of, of this talk. So if you just go on Wikipedia and look at the definition, you will find that an inverse problem in science is the process of calculating from a set of observations, the causal factors that produce them. So if we put that on a little sketch, uh, we can think of the problem this way. We have some input that is unknown and we can think of it as a vector in R to the N or C to the N. And then it's transformed by a process that we know more or less well. So here I know the function F and I have some little N that stands for noise. And it produces some causes or uh, observations Y that can be set off as another vector uh, of a dimension M. And uh, this is what we have access to. And now the forward problem would be to go from X to Y. And the inverse problem is from Y recover X. Uh, so um, it's, it's nice because my notations are, are uh, quite on, on par with, for example, the tutorial of Bob, Bob yesterday, where we also had the observations that were Y. So people will be uh, hopefully following e more easily. And um, this general process is, of course, something that as scientists, we do, I guess, almost every day. And uh, sometimes there are situations where we can expect for a perfect recovery. Actually, uh, this channel that transforms the, the inputs in the outputs is something that is somehow invertible. But there are many um, cases in which we have some loss of information uh, and we are still trying to know what we, we I mean, to, to find out what we can know about the inputs. And of course, this is a problem that, as I was saying, is, is very, very general, and we are not going to uh, cover how to solve inverse problems in general today. What we are going to be focused on is uh, what, uh, how we can use some prior knowledge on uh, the inputs in order to help the reconstruction. And we will follow two main axes, one being the sparsity, and the other one being a neural network priors. Before we dive into those topics, uh, let me maybe tell you about uh, examples of, of simple uh, linear I mean, inverse problems and one being classes of those being linear inverse problems. For linear inverse problems, we are thinking of problems that can be written uh, in, in this fashion where we have the, the function f uh, that was general before that can be reduced to a linear operator uh, that we can uh, uh, write as a matrix A. And although this seems uh, uh, pretty uh, restrictive, actually there are many uh, problems that can be modeled in, in, in this way in real life. And there, are, and there can be also uh, substantial challenges in solving it. Um, so to, to give you a, a few uh, ideas, of course there can be signal to noise ratio issues. So you may have a noise of too high amplitudes, which prevents you from recovering information about the input. Then the linear system you have to solve might be overdetermined, underdetermined, and, and following that, it may be non-invertible, or you can have um, a matrix that is badly conditioned. All of this be making it difficult to solve this inverse problem. And um, to, to give you now concrete examples of um, instances of this linear uh, prob inverse problem, I can think, for example, of an example uh, in genomics. Well, we'll, we will have Y that is a vector that stands for um, pa uh, patients uh, being either sick of LC or LC. Then the matrix A will have as its rows the genome of all of those patients. And then we are trying to recover a vector X that will be indicating which are the losses that have uh, some relevance in predicting the sickness of the patient. Uh, so that's one possible example. Another example, this time in image processing, image processing being one of the, of the main focus actually of this tutorial, is the blurring. And in which case A is a convolutional operator. So for example, with a, a, a Gaussian uh, kernel. And you have, for example, the, an input image, just, a, just like the one that is up there, X, that will produce some observations uh, that corresponds to a blurred image, uh, so convoluted with the Gaussian kernel, more or less blurred given of the, the uh, according to the variance of the kernel. And you want to recover from the blurred image, uh, the one that is um, 
unblocked. And that amounts to solving such a linear inverse problem. So, okay, of, of course, so there are many situations that can be actually modeled as, as linear problems, but there are also situations that are intrinsically nonlinear. And in which case we cannot really say uh, something a, a priori about the form of the, uh, of, the, of the problem. I mean, it will depend on, on what you are interested in. And it can be as diverse as uh, the PD solution or a quadratic system or whatever you would like. And then of course, uh, there are also many challenges in, in solving this problem. So related to the one we mentioned before, there is problem of wealth positiveness. Is the solution, does the solution exist? Is it unique? Uh, is it well behaved um, with respect to when we change a bit the inputs? Thinking a bit ahead of how we are going to solve this problem, we may have some convexity issues uh, in the optimization to find the solution, and so on. Um, again, to give you a, a few examples of famous uh, nonlinear inverse problems in seismology. Uh, we can think of the inverse problem of trying to uh, understand what is the density profile of the ground beneath our feet as a function uh, thanks to uh, the, the recuperation of some waves that are reflected. So we are perturbing at the surface, which is uh, sending a wave in the underground. And then we are collecting all the reflections of the waves. And the reflection of the waves will tell us about the discontinuities in the density underneath the feet, our feet, and so uh, enable us to, to find out all the different layers. So that's one famous nonlinear inverse problem. And then one again in imaging, uh, and that is uh, arising in, in many, many different uh, situations uh, in astronomy or in co coherent diffraction imaging is phase retrieval. In which case we have uh, X that is a specimen of interest we are trying to image. And then A will be the Fourier uh, operator, so transforming uh, X in his, in his Fourier transform. And then we will only have uh, access to the magnitude of this Fourier transform uh, potentially noise. Okay, so that's, that's a few examples of, of inverse problems. Uh, now, how can we use uh, some prior knowledge on the signal in order to help the reconstruction. And the first uh, type of, of help we are going to, to get is from sparsity. So it turns out that many of the signals we are interested in admit a sparse representation with respect to a certain basis. So sometimes it's, it's easy to find the basis in which the signal is sparse just because it's the natural basis in which uh, we are thinking of the problem. So for example, in the, in the genomics example I was, I was giving, we ex expect that only a few locations in the genome will actually be um, relevant. And so we expect that this vector X uh, will actually be sparse uh, directly. Or if we are thinking of the interfaces in, in the ground, uh, we don't expect to have so many different layers. So we are also looking for an outcome which is sparse. But sometimes we need to work to get uh, the right basis or we can resort to some uh, uh, standard basis in, in which we know that signals are uh, often sparse. So that can be uh, the Fourier basis of our images, uh, the autonomous wavelet basis that is uh, particularly interesting uh, for this kind of, of uh, problems in imaging. And if you haven't heard about, about autonomous wavelets, uh, the way they work is that you have a mother wavelet, so a, a mother function such as this one, and then you consider the family of fun functions that is generated by translating and scaling uh, the function. Uh, and uh, that will give you this, this uh, psi of L, the scaling factor, and M, the, the translational uh, factor. And then if you decompose, for example, this brain image among these bases of uh, autonomous wavelets, you get something like this, where you have different pictures that correspond to different scalings, rotations, uh, and you have among the picture the different possible translations. And what you can see is that those uh, decompositions are mostly gray, meaning that they are mostly zero. And that's indeed the representation of an image in uh, the wavelet ba basis is uh, sparse. Okay, so uh, how do we now use this, this sparsity information in uh, the inverse problem at hand? Um, if we start by focusing on linear inverse problems, 
we are going to try to solve the following sparse regression where we have um, a data affinity term. So something that makes our forward model A of X uh, fit the observations Y. And then we have a constraint on the sparsity of the signal that is here written as the L0 norm, which is directly counting the non-zero coefficient of a vector. And that we constrain to have uh, to be lower or equal to some uh, assumed level of sparsity. And if we think about this, for example, in, in the very simple Im, uh, problem of denoising an image, uh, here we will have so the, 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 the linear inverse problem being uh, y, the observation of the noisy image, and then a, the matrix that allows us to go to the autonomous basis, and then x. Uh, being the sparse representation of the image plus some noise and the algorithm can be pretty easy we can so this was the the original data that i was showing you on the slide before now we have the noisy observation image we can decompose it in uh, the wavelets uh, basis in which case we will see that the decomposition is not sparse anymore yet what we can do is uh, only keep the k wavelets that have the largest uh, coefficients in the decomposition. So that will be uh, only keeping, for example, the ones that you see here in black and white. And then we construct the image from this decomposition of wavelets. And you can see that, that uh, using only a, a small number of wavelets, we are able to, uh, de to denoise uh, an image very easily uh, implementing this idea. Nevertheless, in, in general, uh, this path regression I was mentioning is an NP hard problem uh, because the, the algorithm I was just showing you is something that relies on the fact that, that the wavelets are an autonomous basis and that is not something that we will have access to in general. And so there is no efficient uh, polynomial time algorithm to solve this path regression in general. So as a result, it's a very active uh, area of research in signal processing, and there are many different types of algorithms to um, try to solve this path regression. So I'm, I'm definitely not an expert on, on all of them, but I can just uh, mention a few. So greedy algorithms will try to find uh, serially what are uh, the components uh, in the sparse representation that um, contribute the most to the observation and discover them one after the other. There are Bayesian methods, which uh, are something that we heard about by uh, Bob yesterday morning, that are going to try to model some prior information about uh, the, the system and also uh, incorporate a model for the stochasticity sorry, of the observations. And then there are convex relaxation methods, which are uh, pretty handy and uh, that have a nice intuition behind and that I will uh, try to tell you a bit uh, now about. And before I can do so, I will need to uh, make a parenthesis about LP norms. So that's that's something that uh, I, I guess most of you know, but it's just a, a, right, uh, a quick reminder that if I write the, the norm P of a vector, I will have, uh, so the definition being the sum over uh, the components of uh, the entry to the P and then taking the P as root. And the examples that we are maybe used to, to manipulating are the one with the uh, low integer piece. So the, P, the zero norm is the counting the number of non zeros. The L1 norm is summing the modulus of the of the entries and then the L2 norm I don't even uh, present anymore. And now if we think about uh, the geometry of those norms, so here I'm plotting the balls of radius one in those different norms. We have all those different sets for P is equal to zero, one half, one, three halves, and two. And they have uh, interesting properties being that for P strictly smaller than one, the sets that we are um, defining are concave sets. And otherwise they are con convex sets. And then you can also notice that for P strictly uh, smaller than one, uh, well, smaller or equal to one, sorry, they are spiky. And otherwise they are not spiky. So why does this matter to us? Well, uh, if we think about this, this past regression I was telling you about, and if we think of it um, as so a constraint uh, um, 
optimization problem where we are going to look at intersections of sets. So if we are constraining the L1 norm, we are going to constrain something in, in, this, uh, in, the, in this box for a certain level k of sparsity. If we constrain the L2 norm, we are going to uh, constrain something in this disk. And now if we had uh, the, the sets uh, of, of, of um, signals that will be of, um, reproducing the observations, so here, it's, since it's a linear uh, regression, we will have such sets where here we have the, the sets uh, that ensures that this fidelity term is smaller or equal than a margin epsilon. And you can see that in the case where we are using the spiky sets, the L1 uh, constraints, the solution will be uh, on one of the axes, which means that the solution will be sparse because it will have some components being zero. So you can see how using these spiky sets is helping uh, the sparseness, the sparsity of the, of the solution. But also it's much easier to use this L1 constraint than an L0 constraint because uh, the set that we are going to have uh, to optimize over is a set that is complex. So this uh, gave birth to very I mean, uh, famous algorithms that were discovered in different communities simultaneously. Uh, so it's called um, LASSO in the statistics community and basis pursuit in the signal processes processing um, community. And, and it's basically solving this regression problem under the L1 constraint. And under structural assumptions on A, actually, this problem returns the same uh, results as the problem constrained with the L0 norm. It's still harder than, than uh, something with the L2 constraint because the, the L1 norm is non-differentiable, but it's easier than uh, with the L0 norm. And uh, if we, um, I think somebody is not muted, it's, please, yeah. Uh, so if, um, so it's still, it's, it's easier than the L0. And uh, it's still a, a very um, I mean, active uh, research area to find some efficient algorithms uh, for solving this problem. But if you are interested in, you can just go to uh, one of the famous distribution for machine learning, scikit-learn, and you will have a comment that will implement this, this model for you. Um, are there some questions up to here? Okay. Yes. So uh, the, uh, doesn't this reduce to linear programming, basically? The linear programming with constraints, like the simplex method? Um, maybe. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar with, uh, with this. OK. But I'm sure somebody in the audience uh, will know if. Uh, and. OK. OK. And so um, all this, this uh, um, I mean, success and interest uh, for, for solving um, inverse problems based on sparsity actually triggered the, what, what I could call the complementary idea of compressive sensing. So compressive sensing was proposed in the early 2000s. And, and the idea is that if signals admit sparse representations, uh, they are compressible. And then we should be able to design acquisition methods that would directly uh, acquire the signal in a compressed representation. So the, the implementation of that uh, will, induce, will involve some sub Nyquist sampling, meaning that the number of measurements we are going to take is not proportional to uh, the size of the signal and the level of the resolution we want for the signal, but is related directly to the level of sparsity of uh, the signal. And, and, and this uh, can be done directly by, by rewriting this uh, little in, in linear uh, problem I was, I was writing, where we, have, uh, we, has, we are assuming here that we are in the basis in which the signal X is sparse. And we are going to collect a vector Y that will have a dimension m that is much smaller than the dimensionality of the signal through the multiplication with the matrix A that will be therefore short and wide. So it will have much longer rows than, um, than, the, uh, than colons. And, and of course, now the question, is, and, and the reconstruction will uh, be uh, using the same uh, ideas as before for the sparse regression. But 
we need to put some efforts to design a measurement matrix, which is this, this matrix A, that will uh, provide a, an efficient reconstruction because it's not, of course, not possible for all of them. And there are a lot of theoretical works uh, to give guarantees uh, for the minimal number of, of measurements M as a function of the level of sparsity and the different properties of the matrix A. But without entering those details, I think the, um, the, I mean, uh, the important idea is that uh, randomness is particularly efficient. And for example, you could take A being a Gaussian matrix with random IAD entries or uh, randomly subsample Fourier and, and be very efficient in this uh, compressive sensing. So compressive sensing now has, has had uh, a lot of impact and everywhere where measurements are either expensive or time consuming. And so I took this figure from uh, this recent review about compressive sensing and, and you can see according to, to what you are uh, most interested in um, that there are many, many areas uh, of, of applications now of, of compressive sensing. Uh, maybe one of them being the, the most famous being medical imaging uh, with, with accelerated MRI that hopefully I will um, quickly hint out at, at the end of this tutorial. Okay, uh, so what we have seen is that exploding sparsity uh, could really help in solving those uh, inverse problems. And although we focused on linear inverse problems, um, the intuition carries over to nonlinear inverse problems, and, and there it's, it's harder to give some, some general algorithms. It would really depend on, on what's uh, going on in, in the problem that, that you are looking at, but uh, there are definitely some help that can be uh, taken from uh, this um, idea of exploiting sparsity. So those are, uh, I would say nowadays, classical uh, methods and classical ideas. And if you're interested in uh, uh, st uh, I mean, starting with those topics and those algorithms, I wanted to recommend uh, the nice reference of those two websites by Gabriel Perret, who are uh, especially the numerical tours of data science, is providing some uh, notebooks in every language that you, you, you would be interested in probably, uh, in R and Julia and Python in MATLAB, uh, with examples of those little algorithms and um, that, are, that are very nice. Okay, so now what we are going to, to see is, is uh, how we can use more sophisticated models of, uh, of signals, which are uh, neural network uh, priors, and how we can use them in, in the in events problems. So before I start that, maybe uh, I can also, uh, it's a good time to ask questions if there are more. Okay, so let's dive into uh, the neural network priors. Aharnu, sorry, yes. can, I, can I ask a question just to follow up on your um, the, the lasso uh, issue? Mm -hmm. it, like, um, if, if people look at the chat, by the way, um, then uh, Aaron's Ooh. question did get answered. So um, it looks like they're, they're, linear programming can be used to solve the lasso. But I, from my remembering how uh, Christian and his uh, collaborators did it, it's is lasso usually solved iteratively? Um, I, I don't know if you're going to say much about solution methods. Um, no, no. I mean, I'm not in the in. The, so I think there are there are many different different ways of, of solving uh, lasso, and I'm, I'm not an expert. For example, indeed, I think. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel uh, intimidated by the fact that Stefan Mala is talking afterwards, and I'm sure you he, he could tell us much more about about this literature. Yeah. If, if I could, this is Daniel Van, uh, I'm just making a comment. If, so there were two, two bounds. One is the L1 under K, and the other one was like Y minus AX norm, less than okay. epsilon. If you do it component by component rather than the norm, then clearly that can be made into uh, uh, an LP problem, right? With, with slack variables for each. But if you say the whole norm is under, it's better to do this y minus x square plus lambda x1, and that's a quadratic programming problem. If you write each x as difference of two, two non-negative variables, right? And then this L1 norm can be written as, as so, so, so in general, some convex optimization problem, not always LP, can be used for that. It could be a quadratic programming in some problem versions. 
and, and, and also there are many, many methods. One of them is that you can just crank up Lambda or change Lambda and track solutions that there are zillions of different approaches which are iterative, yeah. Uh, it's a whole industry of, uh, okay. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, maybe maybe something I, I didn't uh, say, which was on my slide, is that indeed we can also rewrite the problem as uh, a Lagrangian formulation with the language multiplier uh, to incorporate the constraint on the norm. Um, uh, I'd make a comment on that too. Uh, you know, there's another, there's yet another, the whole industry of this, as someone said, uh, but there's also a thing called elastic uh, regularization as well, which just combines L1 and L2. And um, that one has sort of nice properties for both. It, 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 uh, it makes it kind of smooth because of the L2, but then as it approaches the, the zero point, it then vectors over to one of the one of the coordinates and makes all the others zero. So it starts out very convex and then only at the last moment kind of switches over to driving something things to zero. Um, and then of course you can just change Lagrange multipliers to drive it one way or the other. Yes, so so yes, I mean it's uh, there are a lot of methods and 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 still like ongoing research topic as as yeah. So Cool. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. So now uh, let's let's uh, jump to to I mean the second part of, of this tutorial, which is on um, neural network priors. And uh, something that uh, I, I will have to to tell you about along along this this uh, tutorial is uh, generative models, which are how we are using the expressivity of neural network to model the uh, dimension the the data distributions that we are interested in. Uh, so uh, there are different architectures that we can use to do this, that will go along uh, different sampling methods. And uh, there are different ways of training those uh, so-called generative models so that they can um, grasp the, st the statistics of the data sets that we are interested in. So I will uh, walk you through those different architectures, uh, as well as uh, telling you how uh, we can use them in, in the inverse problems. And the first class of uh, generative models that I want to tell you about are restricted Boltzmann machines, which are uh, historically the first type of uh, neural networks, uh, of no, sorry, of uh, generative models and that are energy-based models, meaning that uh, they are actually an undirected uh, neural network made of two layers, uh, an input and an hidden representation, which units that are typically binary zero one, and then that defines a um, joint distribution over the two layers, that it takes the form of a Boltzmann measure with an energy function uh, that uh, will involve some terms that are pairwise uh, between the inputs and uh, the idents. Sorry, the inputs and the idents. Uh, so in this fashion. So if you are a physicist, this, this should remind you a lot of an Ising model with some uh, local fields and uh, couplings, which in machine learning are, are called uh, biases and weights. And then, but then the difference with, with maybe the Ising model from statistical physics is that uh, here we are going to define the probability over the inputs, so the, the space in which we are interested uh, by marginalizing over the hidden um, variables. And doing so, we are effectively allowing interactions at all orders between the different coordinates of uh, the inputs. So we don't, uh, we are not restricted to those pairwise uh, terms of our interaction. We can effectively model any co type of correlations between uh, the pixels, if you want, of the pictures. If, for example, if X was to uh, represent an image, and this makes uh, it a, a class of, of um, a very expressive class uh, for priority distributions. And then to train uh, such a restricted Boltzmann machine, we will do so in supervised learning meaning that uh, we will have a data sets of examples. So for example, here we have uh, MNIST, that is a data set of unwritten digits. And we are going to maximize uh, the likelihood of this data set. So we are going to maximize the probability that the model is assigning to seeing this data set and maximize over the parameters that are the weights and the biases. 
And that will give us uh, so a set of parameters theta that, that will be the train parameters that we can use afterwards to sample the restricted Boltzmann machine. So this will uh, require us of Markov chain sampling. Uh, and, and I mean, this can be done uh, successively one layer to the next. And then hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get samples that resembles uh, the one that we had in the training sets if our training was successful. So we uh, learned a representation of the data that is incorporated in those parameters. So the applications of those re restricted Boltzmann machines, historically, uh, they were uh, used to pre-train deep neural networks. So now, now it's not the case anymore, but that was one of their primary usage where each uh, layer was pre-trained as a restricted Boltzmann machine unsupervisingly before having the, the, the full learning of the deep neural networks on a supervised task. And they are also very popular actually in the physics um, uh, literature that is starting to use neural networks uh, to uh, uh, help, uh, I mean, different, different areas of physics. So for example, in biophysics, uh, RBMs can be used to model some uh, neuronal spikes. Uh, they can also be used to uh, study uh, protein sequences. And of course, they can also be used in quantum physics uh, to represent uh, density functions of, of many body systems. And, and that was a very, um, I mean, important paper by, by Giuseppe Carleo and, and Matt Astroyer that I think was also mentioned yesterday. So in, in uh, and now how, how can we use those restricted Boltzmann machine uh, for, to solve an inverse problem? Well, we can look at uh, this, uh, I mean, go back to, to the example of the compressed sensing. So recall that uh, we have Y that is uh, a vector of observations that corresponds to uh, the multiplication of X with a measurement matrix A. And we have very few observations compared to the size of the signal, but which is assumed sparse. And here A, can you can think of it as, as uh, being a Gaussian IAD. Then if we want to explore prior information to get uh, X from observations Y, uh, if we have access to typical samples, for example, we can compute the expected sparsity. So for the MNIST data set, it's 150. And then uh, with the observations and one uh, CS uh, algorithm, so this is, uh, we used here approximate message passing, which is um, an, an algorithm that I, I didn't mention, but is one of the many that you can use to, to solve compressed sensing. And then we can look at how uh, the sparse prior is helping the reconstruction. Uh, as we are increasing the number of uh, observations that we are taking, so the number of measurements. And although the expected sparsity is 150 and the dimensionality is 7 and 184, we can see that with 100 measurements, so less than the sparsity, we start to have uh, something that looks like a 6, apparently, in, in this observation that we took. But what we realized uh, in, I mean, during my PhD in, in, in the group I was working with in Paris is that if we have access to typical signals, we could also just train a restricted Boltzmann machine to represent uh, the data distribution of such type of images and then plug it in uh, the reconstruction. So we had an algorithm for that. And then see how this is helping the reconstruction. So first we used a binary RBM which is only modeling the locations of the non-zero pixels in the image. And then we used uh, a full uh, RBM that was also modeling the value of the pixels. And we can see that in this first version with maybe 80 uh, observations, we start to have something that really looks uh, like nine, nine six. But when we have a full training of RBM also on the values of, of uh, the pixels in the image, then with at, as, as little as 60 observations, we are able to do the reconstruction. So of course, uh, the RBM has learned the, the special correlations between the pixels, and so it greatly improved the reconstruction. And uh, this triggered the phrase of whether neural networks were the new sparsity. And this may be surprising, but of course, it's, it's not in the sense that we worked more. We had to have access to a training data set, which is something that is of course, more information than just knowing the expected sparsity, and then train the neural network to get to those level of improvements. But as it's a very nice idea that we are able to combine those two uh, to, to uh, improve the reconstructions. 
So that was with restricted Boltzmann machines. And, and as I was telling you, this is something that is very, um, uh, I mean, historically important and, and still very popular in the, the physics community. Uh, also because they yield some some results that are that are maybe more interpretable than, than other types of, of generative models. But in the machine learning community, they kind of fell out of fashion. Uh, and this is uh, because uh, deep generative models were invented, which is another class of, uh, of generative models. So, uh, and, and maybe before I move on to this, were there some questions about uh, the first uh, example with restricted Boltzmann machine and compressing? Okay. Marilu, I'll, I'll ask something. So the, 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 the digits that come out in your, the, your work here, the six, mm -hmm. this is one sample from the prior, is that um, from the RBM distribution? So you, you happen to have sort of chosen the same sample each time, so that it always came out as six. Is, oh, sorry, that, then it wasn't clear. So what happened is that I gave this six so a six that was from the the mnist uh, as as an x then i measured it with a ma with a matrix a and then i only had access to the observations y and i was wondering whether or not i could recover the six from the mere, the mere knowledge of uh, a vector y okay. that adds a uh, different uh, dimension so the smaller the y the harder the problem oh so you're only observing 60 pixels or something it's I mean, it's 60 Gaussian projections. That's your projections. OK, like, yes. like retina wood or something. Yes. OK. And cool. so we are, we are seeing how many of those Gaussian projections we need in order to reconstruct the signal. And this is greatly uh, improved by uh, I mean, the addition of a trained RBM in the reconstruction process. All right, thank you. Welcome. I have a quick question. Um, it seems that uh, if you go from 20 to 40 to 60 observations, uh, while the sparse prior sort of doesn't look great for any of them, and the six begins to emerge out of what clearly is not yet a, a very good solution, the RBM seems to be completely wrong and then suddenly right. Um, is there is there um, a way to quantify the robustness of that? So, I mean, is there, I mean, in the, in the sense that even for 20 or 40 observations, the RBM seems to really decide on some form rather than uh, give you a diffuse cloud. Uh, and so I was wondering, in terms of quantifying the uncertainty of these restrictions and realizing at what point the restriction, the reconstruction is um, believable, uh, you know, is, in what sense? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I understand your question. So, um, I mean, the Okay, so with this method of approximate message passing, actually, we are uh, effectively estimating entire posteriors. So we have access to uh, a variance of the estimate that we are producing. And I confess that we didn't check it, but, but it would be interesting to see uh, if the variance of the estimate is indeed uh, becoming uh, much smaller when it's get, getting towards the, the actual solution of, of the problem. That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, but I mean, it's 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 um, here we are touching upon uh, uh, two interesting things. I think first, the fact that as humans we have a prior of of thinking that oh this is just undecided, whereas this is decided but this is wrong. But this is kind of our representation of of the fact that the blur is undecided, but it's still I mean it's the output of the reconstruction. Um, but the, it would fool us as being this one would fool us as being something that is uh, that is uh, uh, I mean a true minimum if you want. Uh, whereas this one we would just say oh, okay the, the algorithm doesn't know. So I think that's interesting. And then the other thing is that indeed the the neural net was uh, trained uh, on the uh, distribution. So it's trying to to project this distribution in everything he's going to see, and and that we'll see uh, later on in in the tutorial how uh, I mean the the problems that could come from from this kind of approach and one element of solution um, towards this. Marilu, so, I have a follow up question. Um, a little bit like on intuition, why adding the RBM makes it better? If so it, it makes it better because if you want, when you are doing the reconstruction, 
you are taking into account uh, the correlations uh, that are between the pixels of, of the signal, because those were learned by the RBM and it learned how images of uh, unwritten digits um, are having correlations between the pixels and what they are. So this is why it's, it's helping a lot. Thanks. OK. Um, so now, uh, next generation, if you want, deep generative models. So um, what are deep generative models? They are uh, modeling distributions in the following way. So they have an input layer that is a simple Latin distribution. So you can think of P of Z as a, a multivariate Gaussian, for example. And then you have a feed forward network, the, I mean, the kind of neural network that, that, every, uh, that is just a highly uh, uh, non-trivial parameterized function that creates uh, the, the output X that we will be interested in. So that is just a uh, function G theta of Z, theta being the parameters of the neural networks that can be learned. So how are those deep generative models uh, trained? Well, it's, it's the same story. So you, you start with the data set to do your unsupervised learning. And there are two main paradigms, one being uh, to maximize the log likelihood or equivalently minimize the KL divergence between the empirical data distribution N and the distribution defined by the model. And again, this is uh, maximizing here the log of the probability of observing uh, the data sets uh, given the model. And this is, for, for example, uh, the paradigm that is used in bash null into encoders that we uh, heard of uh, yesterday from Ashley. And there is another paradigm uh, that has brought some, some great improvements and, and that is quite different, which is called adversarial training. And that is for generative adversarial networks. And in the adversarial training class, uh, there is some additional element, which is an adversary that is a discriminator. And the discriminator is another function, another neural network that is meant to distinguish between samples that are drawn from uh, the data distribution, so from the training sets, and samples that are actually coming from the generative models. So it, it works in the following way, the loss. So you are computing the expected log of the probabilities that the uh, discriminator is recognizing a general sample as genuine plus the expected probability log of the probabilities that the discriminator is recognizing um, fake um, sample as fake. And then you are uh, trying to make the discriminator as good as possible. So you are maximizing that with the respect to uh, the, the parameters of the discriminator. And then you are minimizing uh, that with respect to the parameters of the generator, meaning that the generator is trying to generate samples that are as good as possible, so as to fool uh, the, um, the, uh, the discriminator. That the discriminator is not able to uh, make the difference between what's real and what's actually generated by the model. So the, the, the key point about, about those deep generative models is that they can include convolutions. And in this way, they were the first generative models to be able to generate uh, very uh, convincing images, for example, of, of images, of uh, faces, sorry. And in this case, of course, they don't have the, the little Tori architectures that I draw up there, but they, they look uh, more like this, like this deep convolutional GAN, where you have many different channels and, and uh, different filters for convolutions and many different layers. But eventually what those, those architectures are able to produce is, for example, those pictures of faces of people that uh, do not exist. Um, and, and why are they such good, I mean, interesting uh, representations of the data? Uh, so that's the, the, the intuition is that they are effectively, I mean, they are capturing the effective degrees of freedom of the data sets that we are interested in. So um, if you think about uh, the images of faces, so I mean, images live in a very uh, high dimensional uh, space, but maybe that the only, uh, the space that is occupied by images of faces is a much lower dimensional manifold in this uh, large ambient space. And so here you would have different faces uh, 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 traveling in this, in this manifold, whereas if you would go off the manifold, uh, what you would see is just random noise. And now what's, it's uh, thanks to the architecture of the generative model that has a small latent uh, distribution. This is exactly what be, is being learned in a way, uh, this low dimensional embedding of the, the class of images, uh, for example, we are interested in. And we can verify that by doing interpolation in the Latin space. So here, 
uh, we take four different samples of a generator that was trained on images that are related by the fact that they share some uh, of the coordinates in the latent uh, distribution. So, I mean, uh, those two will share one, those two will, will share uh, another one, and, and so on. And then we can look at all the images that we would uh, generate if we are just uh, changing uh, those, uh, I mean, we are interpolated between the, the different value of the latent coordinates. And you can see that uh, you are able to actually generate images uh, that always look like faces and that con continuously go from one image to the next. And so you are really just uh, having those latent coordinates that is uh, um, uh, capturing, if you want, the viability uh, of, of your network. And so we have this, this intuition now that if we have a good uh, low dimensional representation of, of our data, we should be able to explode that in uh, inverse problems. And so we can go back to this uh, compressed sensing uh, problem that I was telling you about. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just putting back the little sketch where we have uh, Y that will be uh, a vector of observations we will have access to, and we will try to go back to the X uh, that generated those um, observations, knowing that Y is much smaller uh, than X. And uh, the way to do so with the generator is to find an image in the range of the generator that is in accordance with the observations. So ultimately, what we are going to try to do is to, to solve the, the inverse problem with, with uh, having something that um, have produces with the format model something that is close to the observations. But now we are going to optimize over the value of the latent representation Z. And interestingly, this optimization can actually be done quite straightforwardly with, with gradient descent uh, algorithms. And uh, if we look at uh, the number of uh, uh, observations, I mean, the, the reconstruction error as a function of the number of measurements, we, and we compare this with the uh, solutions that would uh, uh, correspond to looking at the sparse basis of the images, so either the Fourier base or the wavelets, and then apply the lasso, we can see that we have much smaller reconstruction error as a function, I mean, as with much uh, fewer number of measurements. And this can be also seen uh, by looking directly at the reconstructed images, where on the top row, you have the original image. And here you have the two solutions using the lasso and the sparse basis. And as a last row, you have uh, the DC GAN solution. For here, uh, a, a number of measurements that is 2,500 compared to uh, I mean, images that live in much, much uh, bigger uh, dimension. Okay, so this was, was an example, but, but we can phrase it much more generally, uh, this strategy to use uh, inverse problems to, um, I mean, to use deep generative models to solve inverse problems, sorry. So we are going to change this, this original problem of fi finding X that minimizes the, the, this um, difference. I can ask a question uh, on the last slide. Uh, how, did, how do you, in so you're, what you're trying to do is find the set, set of inputs that generate something you desire, um, right? I mean, you, if you have an original image, you'd like the generator to be producing that original image, which means finding the Z inputs, I guess, that generate that image, right? Yeah, so, so yes, this is what you are, you are trying to look for, but of course you are losing information along the way because you have a compressed uh, set of observations that you have only access to. Right, um, but that it, it's possible that face, is it possible that face isn't in the manifold of your system? I mean. So yeah, so, so that's, that's what we are going to get to in, in a few. In a oh, okay, all right, all right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's an excellent question. I, I completely agree. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I mean, just to to and take a, a step back on on the um, on the strategy, we are just uh, now going to look for solution to the inverse problem that are going to involve a trained uh, generative model. So prior to solving the inverse problem, we need to have access to a data set to train our generative models. And then we are going to solve by looking for uh, a latent representation that uh, produces images that are in accordance with the observation. Okay, what can go wrong? So there is this problem of representation error, which I think is exactly your question of what if the image I'm actually trying to reconstruct is not in the range of the generative model. There is a problem of, uh, I mean, related of generalizing out of the training set. So how 
tied am I to, to the type of data I fed to the generative model uh, when doing the, the reconstructions? And I think there is even the, the much bigger problem of, of having at all access to a training set. So for the two first type of problem, uh, we can represent, I mean, I can, I can tell you a bit more, just show you uh, indeed that there can be problem. So as you were saying, so I can try to find directly without losing any information, text takes a given image XD and try to find whether or not uh, there is an image within the range of the generative model that is going to, um, to uh, correspond to this image. And the, the answer is that, for example, with this DC GAN, well, no, there is a sub, uh, substantial uh, representation error. So here you have uh, the original images, whereas here you have uh, the images that are um, uh, reconstructed by the GAN. And you can see that there is, even though the GAN had all the information to reconstruct the images, it was not able to do so perfectly. So there is a substantial representation error uh, to those uh, deep generative models. This is sort of what you're doing right now. So. Sorry, is there a question? Oh, sorry, no. Um, and then for the for the question of generalizing out of sample. Uh, so the, the training data that they look actually, I mean, of, for example, the data set that was used here is called Celeb A. So it's a data set of images of, uh, of celebrities uh, that are young and smiling. Now, if we are trying to reconstruct images from uh, um, still faces, but that are maybe a bit out of this, um, of this uh, uh, range, uh, you can see that it's it's doing actually quite poorly. So you have here the, the true images. So those are the authors of the paper, by the way. And this is the, the convolutional uh, outputs. And you can see that if you are trying to reconstruct an image with someone with a beard or sometime somebody with a turban, then it's it's too far from the what the, the generative model was trained on. Uh, in order for, for the generative model to uh, actually succeed in the reconstruction. So interestingly here, uh, there is a, a, another type of generative model that is uh, partially answering those, those two problems, which are normalizing flows. So uh, normalizing flows are deep generative models that work in the same uh, uh, fashion as the deep generative model in the sense that they have a latent distribution uh, that is propagated in order to, to uh, create signals. But they are bijective, so they are only involving invertible transformations, such that from an image we can actually compute the invert uh, and the latent representation that uh, corresponds to it. And uh, effectively, this means that they have the same dimension in the input and in the output. So they can be trained with maximum likelihoods. And if we go back to this compressive sensing example, we will see that they have zero representation error meaning that they are going to be able to perfectly reconstruct on those examples that are not too far from the training set. And they can even generalize well out of the training set. So here you have uh, images even of Shrek that are well reconstructed onto, uh, under this in compressive sensing problem, uh, thanks to normalizing flows. So of course, this is not at all intuitive because here there is not this, this idea of the low dimensional manifold that is being captured by the architecture of the network. And it's uh, ongoing research to understand what what is uh, working. I mean, how things are working here, uh, and and uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, with with anybody who's interested. And if we go back so to to this uh, general strategy slide with with what can go wrong. So uh, normalizing flows are a part of the answer for those two first problems, but I think what is much more salient is actually the the, the very uh, problem of even having access to uh, a training set. And what I'm going to say next is for now restricted to uh, the case of images, but it turns out that uh, there can be untrained neural network priors that are still uh, good uh, representations of the data. And so if I, if I just remind you what was the, the workflow for the trained models, we had uh, so a, a data set with uh, a data set that was, was, that was used to train the generative models. And then we were looking for the latent representation that was optimal. With the data set free strategy uh, that was proposed uh, in this paper, Deep Image Prior, and, and a subse subsequent uh, important work is the Deep Decoder, one will draw a fixed uh, latent representation. 
And this is not going to be going to be changed anymore uh, for the old process of reconstruction. And then adjust the parameters of a deep neural networks to the single observations that we are trying to uh, make the reconstruction from. So find the parameters of the neural the neural network uh, theta star. And then the reconstructed image will be just the transformation of the fixed random uh, latent representation by this um, neural networks that has been adjusted just to the one observations. And the intuition is that this works because neural networks uh, architecture and, and in particular convolutions are biasing the reconstruction to uh, natural images. And uh, of course, this is something that looks very promising because you don't even need to have access to a training uh, set in order to uh, be able um, uh, in order to be able to to make the the reconstruction, and uh, and and I can tell you rapidly about two examples uh, of of this application of those uh, untrained image priors. The first example is uh, for coherent diffraction imaging, and it's based actually on a paper we recently uh, submitted with collaborators at CCM. And CDI is an imaging technique uh, that uh, enables to uh, make images at nanoscales using uh, typically X-rays. And uh, so there is a, a, a beam of X-rays that is going through a specimen, and then the diffraction pattern is collected in on uh, the CCD. And here we are going to focus on the holographic setting, where we add a known reference in the beam. And this is to help the reconstruction. And one of the things that is also making this reconstruction difficult is the fact that we have a beam stop mask that is going to uh, zero out, uh, I mean, or mask what's uh, the, the highest intensity pixels in the CCD in order to protect it, because those are several orders of magnitudes uh, larger than the intensity of the rest. And so in this, in this example, the, the noiseless for one model is that the in intensity that one is going to um, collect on the CCD is equal to, so the Fourier transform of uh, both the specimen and the reference that is masked uh, by the, the beam stop and then taking the, the uh, uh, sorry, the magnitude of this Fourier transform. So that's the noiseless case. But it gets even more tricky because in practice, uh, one often needs to be in the low photon regime. So only have a very low intensity beam that will go through the specimen. And this means that these uh, measurements will be highly corrupted by a Poisson uh, shot noise that is modeling what is going on in the reception of the, of the, the photons on the pixels. And uh, there will be a, a parameter N sub P that is the number of photons per pixel that is uh, controlling this level of noise. And OK, so uh, based on, on what I just said about how we can use uh, uh, untrained priors to do the reconstruction, uh, the proposed strategy that we have is to uh, incorporate the forward model in the objective. So the forward model are those two equations I was just showing. And this means uh, really taking into account the fact that we have a Poisson distribution for the noise and not using the squared loss uh, that I've been uh, using without even really thinking about it since the beginning of the tutorial. And then, uh, so do the reconstruction uh, with the untrained prior, meaning that uh, writing the math about how we are going to, to minimize the, the, the error with the forward model, I mean, we would get this, this outcome. But importantly, we have replaced the image by a G theta of that, and we are going to optimize the parameters of uh, the untrained prior, and then reconstruct the image by just projecting on uh, the the data on the sorry on, by passing the latent distribution to the generator, and this optimization can be done using uh, uh, just a PyTorch, so a deep learning package. Um, and if ever somebody is, is interested in doing Fourier phase retrieval onto the images, actually for this publication, we have a coded up package that we will uh, soon release and that we are happy to share with uh, everybody at, I mean, anybody at Flatiron that would be interested. And okay, implementing this strategy, we were able to uh, compare uh, the compare it to benchmark algorithms for uh, different levels of noise. And here, the higher number of, of, of uh, photons mean the lower number of level of noise. And we can see that if we are comparing to benchmark algorithms, uh, either doing the 
and direct optimization, but all the more so if we are including an entry prior, we are really um, managing to reconstruct much better this image of virus. And if we have very, very drastic level of noises, uh, we are still able to distinguish a bit the outline and the contrast of the image, uh, which is lost uh, by the, the other algorithms. And we were also able to uh, to look at, at the impact of, of the area under the beep stop, so, so the information that we are losing um, at the center of the diffraction pattern, so the, the low frequencies. And again, uh, against uh, benchmark algorithms, as we are increasing the number, I mean, the area that is uh, lost under the beam stop, uh, using this strategy is really making a difference, uh, which, uh, um, um, and all the more so if we increase the noise, and which really uh, uh, inside the fact that these uh, type of untrained priors could be really practical tools uh, in experimental uh, uh, conditions with all of the challenges that goes with it. But of course, this was for simulated data. Uh, now it's it's nice that uh, you have um, that there is another example that is on uh, the uh, um, uh, MRI. So uh, what's what's nice about MRI is that actually we can look at the accelerated MRI problem, in which case we are applying those idea of of compressing to uh, have to take fewer measurements in order to do the reconstructions. And this means that uh, we can have some ground truth, uh, which is the case where we would have taken all of the, of the information by taking the time of making all of the uh, measurements and not downsampling it. And okay, and, the, and in this, this uh, paper, um, very recent, uh, they were able to show that um, untrained priors were behaving uh, similarly than a supervised method for solving uh, inverse problems. And, better than classical regularization methods such, uh, such as the total variation. So um, that was uh, all that I wanted to, to uh, mention today. And if I just uh, summarize it in, in a few words, uh, we've seen, we've um, talked about classical methods uh, that rely on sparsity um, up to uh, an application that goes to uh, the acquisition itself of the signal in a compressed uh, fashion. And then we discussed uh, generative models and how uh, we can even use them if we don't have access to uh, a data set. And uh, there are more ways to incorporate machine learning in inverse problems. And if you are interested, you should check this uh, review, Deep Learning Techniques for Inverse Problems in Imaging, where, for example, you can see that uh, depending on the information you have about the forward model or the training data that is available, you have a lot of, of different things uh, that one can do. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.